Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Well, I've got a shortened episode this week, but I did want to get something together and just fill you guys in a little bit on what's been going on behind the scenes because I've been a little bit quiet on the content making front on YouTube, but obviously there's still plenty of happening in Collective Shift and behind the scenes as always. So look, we've continue to grow at a crazy rate. I'm just going to um, share a couple of clips with you um, while I'm chatting. As you see, we only passed 100,000 on YouTube not that long ago, and we're up to 143. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago on, on Twitter, 100,000 and 115, and obviously Collective Shift and all the free content we have there, as well as the premium signups have grown at a rapid clip. And I think it's because we've got a half a dozen content uh, producers now and the I guess the weight is a little bit off my shoulders um, with so many other great uh, employees that we've trained up that are really on the beat they got their finger on the pulse of sharing a lot of the stuff that I used to share um, as well as some other unique things so look that's all fantastic uh, it's not to say that I'll be doing any less uh in the future or whatnot it's just that at the moment when there's a lot happening um, I guess just to fill you in that's uh the way things are going at the moment with multiple people being able to pick up the slack just a little bit when I need a little bit of a break. But I did want to share um, a couple of things with you. So on Friday night, we actually had a bit of a uh, celebration, I guess, of how far we've come. And we've just finished some new renovations in our uh, new office and whatnot. So it's just a little bit of a look through of that evening. Uh, and look, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend. So I've had a lot going on, uh, I guess, uh, personally, and some of you know, um, a little while ago, I actually broke my back, and that's been playing up again lately. So it's not uh, great to travel <laughs> when you've got that sort of playing up. Um, and a few other things that I just want to get on top of as we, you know, it's just been a crazy period for the bull market, for the business, for crypto in general. And there's, um, you know, uh, some other things that I just want to prioritize for the time being. And, you know, I've always been really open with you guys about what's going on um, with everything. So I guess um, that's one thing I do want to share, but I also just want to share with you some of these renovations. So I run through the office. Um, I might turn the sound down and just commentate this myself. But yeah, this is, <laughs> we've come a long way since I built Nuggets News from a rickety old chair uh, on a rickety old table on a rickety old phone, a Samsung S4, when I shot those first few videos. And this is our uh, office now in Melbourne. So as I said, we've got 20-odd staff, um, probably even more than that now when you count all the uh, casuals and contractors and everything. But it's crazy to think about. And I think hopefully when some of you see things like this, you know, behind the scenes, this is how, how big Nuggets News has grown and what it's become. And Often, if you don't see a video on YouTube, you think, oh, there's nothing happening. But, you know, there's literally an entire ecosystem of things that we're doing. Um, you know, the, the duck's legs are always paddling under the surface, even if you might not see, uh, you know, some tweets or some videos or whatnot. So, you know, even uh, the little, little pet cage there. So, you know, full kitchen, got to keep everyone fed and happy. Uh, but this is a pretty massive space these days. You know, we had three different offices last year and I wasn't able to get over to visit any of them because of COVID, you know, we're in lockdown um, and I'm down in Tassie. So, hey, hopefully this gives you guys another insight to something that you might not have really ever thought about or known the team's grown this big. You know, we've got an entire kitchen out the back there, um, you know, lunchroom as well as the office uh, meeting rooms and whatnot. So yeah, something a little bit different there. I hope that does give you some bit of an insight as to the business that we've grown rather than just the, the YouTube channel. Um, and uh, finally, I might say a few words at the end, but um, I've got a few little passion projects I want to sink my teeth into as well. I just want to make sure that I've got, I guess, uh, the business right, members comfortable and happy with everything that they're getting um you know myself right with my own health and you know family first all that type of thing as well because i don't think the bull market's over i think we could be coming up on another huge wave and i really want to have everything right for that uh that next part of the cycle should it come around so guys don't uh worry or stress if i'm um not too active on those socials as i said hopefully all that look behind the scenes 
uh, let you know or up to. So I'm going to check that that's all still recording. Fantastic. Last thing I want is, is for all that to cut out. But uh, without further ado, let's get into the news. So Telstra this time, the latest of the big corporates in Australia to get a fine, a 50 million slap on the wrist um, as that loss of trust in the, the big, uh, big business continues. We know that's been an ongoing problem in Australia. However, business sentiment hits these stunning new records. So a lot of people in, in business are now really confident going forward. And this is slightly different to, I guess, consumer sentiment. And it's because of the conditions we have, you know, low interest rates, easy money, stocks at record highs, the rich are getting richer. So that's not a surprise that business confidence is high. Now, Australian Central Bank, the RBA, have followed in the footsteps of um, particularly the US Fed, but all these other central banks in that the stimulus is going to continue even as the economy roars. So we've spoken about how they've uh, moved the goalposts. They're starting to talk about unemployment now. Uh, And if unemployment actually ever gets met, even with the fudged figures, they'll just move those goalposts again. So that easy money is going to continue. And this is literally what they want. They want that business confidence higher because businesses know that they have, you know, monetary policy has got their back. And and this is, it's an unfortunate situation. They believe that's the best policy to grow the economy going forward. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, we've obviously got the, the little guy. And this is where we see things like Commonwealth Bank are the latest to um, raise their fixed loan, um, home loan rates. So yes, businesses can borrow and some countries have negative rates where they'll even um, pay you to borrow money to buy back your shares or whatever it is. But now it's the other end of the spectrum where there's all this money being printed, they're welcoming inflation, and guess what happens? The cost of living goes up, all those other goods, um, you know, everyday expenses. But now you've also got the biggest expense for most people's budget. It's those mortgage repayments or your rent. Um, But when the fixed rate home loans are starting to creep up, this is exactly what set off, you know, the GFC. So the RBA, uh, um, you know, I just laugh at this headline that of all the things they're concerned about, they're worried about this un- unusually large household savings. So it's almost like heaven forbid uh, that that everyday Aussies actually save some money to the point where the RBA are like scratching their heads and going, oh, why are people saving money? You know, they, they literally don't want you to do that. They need you to go out and spend. The last thing they want is for people to, you know, be responsible and save for something. It's almost to them like it doesn't compute. Oh, why wouldn't they go into debt? Why wouldn't they put on their credit card or after pay it? Why on earth would someone save money until they can afford something? And so this is what they're now worried about, um, un- unusually large household savings. Uh, so house prices are a risk for all state governments, warns the housing minister. So once again, it's just this uh, passing of the buck when the housing minister is warning now state governments. So it's not actually his job anymore. It's sort of kick the can down the road, pass it on to someone else. Uh, it's the state governments that should be um, worried or it's the risk to them. It, it, nobody wants to take responsibility here. Another thing that I've spoken about a lot is that as this bubble gets bigger and bigger, there's no other option than to increase these first home owner, first home builder, and those sort of grants because they're never actually going to get to the the root of the problem and say, well, how can we stop house prices going up or what's the cause here? How can we address that? It's always after the fact. So guess what? You know, single parents are the latest ones now uh, to get, I think, it was it 2% down? Yeah, just 2% down home loans. Uh, if we saw that the scheme for uh, young first home owners with the five percent downs only a few months ago, we've now got single parents being able to buy with two percent down. Now, none of that really is going to help them pay off this incredible debt or whatever. But this is just their thinking. Literally, the words out of the prime minister's mouth were, "You know, we've just got to get them on the property ladder so they can then, you know, benefit from the bubble getting bigger." It's just crazy, crazy stuff that this is the the line of thinking. Uh, property hit by $2.7 billion tax austerity plan in Victoria. This is where they're now looking to do other things um, instead of the stamp duties, you know, maybe an annual housing land tax. This is such a big part of those uh, the state budgets that something has to change. Now, in terms of Australia's local economy, you know, 
production, manufacturing, what are we good at? Are we really knuckling down? Are we putting any you know tax incentives or policy changes in place to improve that area? Not really. And this is where you run the risk of becoming a um, you know a Venezuela or something like that. That's obviously an extreme example. But if you're not good at producing and manufacturing and doing all those things yourself, you know s- sustainably. These are the problems that are going to arise in Australia. It's already starting to sort of happen. You know, Australia is running low on timber, cars, pianos, you know, just to name a few. Now, thankfully, we've actually had a bit of a rescue deal for our last few oil refineries, saving you know a thousand or so jobs. But we've seen this in so many other sectors. It's just um, you know it's gone and never come back. You know, Ford, Holden, uh, whatever it is. Now, in terms of investment, this is another aspect of this altogether. I've spoken about how some nations and pension funds, sovereign funds, whatever it is, they now don't even invest in countries or businesses that don't have a, uh, you know, a, a green plan, an ESG plan, renewables. They're trying to avoid things like coal and you know, dirty energy or whatever you want to call it. So, everyone's got their own opinion on this kind of thing, but Australia at the moment is just getting by, but I don't think that's going to stay the same going forward. So the G7 have already agreed to stop international funding for coal. Um, you know, China is obviously planning to wean itself off just about everything Australian at the moment, including our biggest uh, export, you know, our iron ore. Uh, Beijing have suspended all the China-Australia strategic economic dialogue and this is something that I just about every day we get uh, news that Australia is trying to cozy up to other countries and China's going elsewhere. You know, China are green like these massive gold exports, and this could be another example of just Australian gold, but instead, you know, it's going to probably come from elsewhere. You know, rare earth metals. There's so many things that if we go into a commodities boom, Australia could have been leveraging to sell to China. That they've probably shot themselves in a foot, um, shot themselves in the foot a little bit now. So another cool article here, just talking about the uh, yuan and whether or not they should sort of offset this to um, make up for this big price surge in, in Australia. We've had a, a similar problem recently with, for example, when the iron ore prices were going sky high, the Aussie dollar was strengthening. In some ways, that's a good problem to have, particularly if we're going to have to start buying and importing everything. A strong Aussie dollar would be good. But um, at the moment, the RBA seemed pretty dead keen on just defending that uh, level with our uh, Australian QE, however you want to think of it as. Now, New Zealand are just taking a completely different approach on a lot of these fronts. So particularly with housing, they're admitting that it's unaffordable and that it needs to be addressed. Um, they've spoken about all these differences with China and how it's getting harder and harder to, to reconcile those and just look past them. So look, I really, for one, appreciate the honesty from um, uh, Jacinda Ardern and the way she's gone about things, whether or not we get a bit more of a tourism uh, bubble between the two. Um, or whatnot, but look, I, I really wish that we saw a little bit more of this just transparency and openness with the communication on a lot of topics that are affecting Australia as well, uh, but we seem to be turning a, a blind eye or just making the problem worse. Now, China, amongst all that's going on, have managed to land on Mars, so closing the gap with the US space station. It's funny how this supremacy for um, you know, the biggest economy, whether it's imports, GDP, however you want to measure it. Now we've got the space race as well, where it's almost like the uh, beating of the chest about who's the biggest superpower in the world. All these little things, I guess, um, add up, don't they? Uh, the IMF have, has urged $50 million in spending to commit to help end the um, COVID pandemic. Before this, they were urging more and more spending to ward off climate change or whatever it is. So this is all they can do is get countries into debt and encourage more spending. So it's just about all you're going to ever hear them say in the headlines. Uh, China, Japan, South Korea here, again, just all vowing to boost financial ties amid the pandemic. So cozying up, maybe getting away from Australia and some of these other countries that are, whether it's sanctions or whatever it is, um, looking to partner elsewhere one thing that i did want to note here that's going to come to absolutely no surprise to any of you 
Pfizer have got this vaccine. At the moment, it's the leader, despite some of these known side effects or whatever. But already we've seen some of the CEOs or the heads of the these different companies come out and say, oh, look, we really think you're going to benefit from uh, a booster or even a third dose. And guess what? It's profit first with big pharma. So it's no good if everyone on the planet has to have one. Guess what? You can double or triple it if they have to have two or three. So uh, no surprise there from big pharma. Eurozone falls into a double dip recession amid the pandemic. Um, hey, I love these headlines. Greed, bankers, and politics all star in Danish negative rate debacle. So remember, some of these countries have been in negative interest rates for, oh, what, 2012? What's that? Uh, nine years, you know, going on a decade. And I think it's only just now we're to the point where money has been printed. Sp- to the extent that we may actually be seeing inflation or it's bypassed the banking system and going more directly to the consumer. We're seeing it in commodities, at cost of living, food. Uh, so this big experiment, is it's coming to an end, but negative rates for nearly 10 years in some of these countries. Here's another round of big banks um, hit the hardest with some of these fines. This is another bond cartel. So, you know, we can't have a, a Bitcoin ETF or cryptos are... Too volatile, there's too much insider trading. Remember all these things that we, we keep hearing from the powers that be, but the biggest markets in the world, the most important markets in the world, you know, the bond markets, they've still got cartels at some of these big household name banks that are colluding and just getting these fines. Once again, slap on the wrist stuff a few hundred million compared to how much they would have made and you know, they've got away with it and they'll do it again. Uh, U.S. So this is another Senate China bill adding $52 billion for U.S. chip making. So looking to end that reliance on China, we know that there's a global shortage of these semiconductors and chips. Um, this is another great example of something that Australia will be short on and do we have the capacity and the means to produce our own that's another great industry that we'd love to to have and to bring that back home. I actually know in Tassie we do have some uh, little chip manufacturers, which is fantastic. All right, so here we see S and P five hundred. This is the short interest as a percent of market cap, and we're all the way back to two thousand levels right before the dot com bubble. So just about everyone that is is short or was short or short hedge funds have blown up by now there's very very few market participants left that are willing to short the market so that is the sign of some very very exhausted bears and a long long bull market stock buybacks hit a record so i think last year i mentioned that we had to put these on pause with uh, COVID, some of those rules, and what we're going to see afterwards is like a record bounce back. And sure enough, um, that's literally happened now where they've got to make up for that lost time. So we're seeing record amounts of share buybacks. Uh, the House Republicans have introduced another $400 billion transportation bill. So these infrastructure spends, um, Republicans also, you know, $1.7 trillion being proposed. The big spending, uh, those promises continues. And, and Janet Yellen is more than willing to approve all these. This is what this is their go-to at the moment. This is the base case. This is you know spend big. Raw materials boom is reordering the six point three trillion dollar ETF world. So all sorts of commodity ETFs. Hey, there's an ETF for everything these days. But these raw materials, and this is something that kind of irks me. I've spoken about the difference between the real economy, you know, tangible versus intangible. And there's a, you know, a coming boom and rise of the price of all these inputs for manufacturing. But rather than being able to, you know, invest in that sector directly, people want exposure through these ETFs and these vehicles. But what happens when all these prices get pushed up? It's the people that are producing the real things that actually need these real goods, the commodities as their inputs. The the price of that is going up and it hurts them and yet it's the guys on Wall Street that are pushing a button on a keyboard and betting that the cost of those goods are going to go up and so they're getting rich while it's the people in the real economy that are hurting. So once again, it's that tangible versus intangible argument that the scales are just tipped so far uh, in favor of the intangible, that digital Wall Street world. 
um, that I just think it's it's like creaking. How long until the people, the plants in the real world start showing up on Wall Street and saying, hey, it's no good you guys making money and betting all this stuff when we can't even make things in the real world. Uh, S&P 500, so the real earnings yield has hit a 40-year low. So this is why gold is really starting to glisten as well. Those real interest rates. So when you take into account inflation, what's the actual yield that we're getting, the uh, dividend or the reward, it's actually at those 40-year lows now. So it no longer makes sense to park your money in those shares. You're still falling behind. So mark your calendar. There's finally some talk of an of a taper. And remember the taper tantrum we saw last time. And there's no way they're going to be able to do it again this time. And you know, cut back all that QE. Uh, Peter Schiff's spoken about this at length. But we've seen this enormous number. So if you go all the way back to where are we here? So this is the overnight reverse repo rates. Uh, and this is the fifth highest ever, I think. So yeah. This is the Fed and those uh, liquidity operations to the tune of $350 billion in one night where there's such a huge demand for treasuries at the moment. Uh, and so the Fed are actually flooded the system too much to the point now where they're actually having to... Um, the bonds are the things that are in need now, not the shortage of US dollars as we had in the past, which is a flip on its head, but it's crazy to think that that's the way the things are going. And now, because this is the case, you know, those negative real yields, that's the environment when gold and silver become very attractive again. But silver's also got that industrial component, so it's no surprise that silver's up 70% in a year. Um, experts saying it could have further to go. Hey, let's hope so. But it's it's gold that's glistening. And remember the last few weeks I've sort of spoken about how when gold's so far out of favor and everyone's talking about how it's dead and everyone's dropping Gold for Bitcoin, you know, that's the time when you probably want to get interested and have a have a serious look about buying the thing that's uh, unloved. And sure enough, we're actually starting to see now some investors have taken some profit on some of their Bitcoin and maybe rotated into gold. At least that's what some of these JP Morgan analysts are saying, which probably tells you that they've already taken that position and uh, obviously now they want that to fly so their positions can uh, make them some profit. All right, so into the crypto news. Tether's finally had their first reserves breaking down, showing that well, different numbers being thrown around, cash or cash equivalents. It's still a little bit murky. Some people are unhappy, but um, I think the pressure's on now with um, USDC just doing such a good job and growing so quickly. So the pressure is on Tether <clears throat> to kind of get to that level of transparency as well. Um, USDC is growing, seeing growing demand in all these different countries now, including Latin America. Uh, Faye stablecoin has finally hit its um, hit its peg, hit its target for the first time. This is a month after launch, so it's only taken a month for them to actually get um, to their peg, to their target. So that is a difficult, I guess, thing to achieve for a lot of these newer stablecoins playing around with these funky algorithms and whatnot. Look, I'm a, I'm a fan of keeping it simple, to be honest. Uh, PayPal rumors, a harbinger for stable coins, the future of crypto payments. Everyone's getting on board. We've seen MasterCard adding more startups to their accelerator. Payments providers, uh, MoneyGram now allowing Bitcoin buying and selling across all their retail networks. Uh, Square's posted another massive earnings surprise thanks to their Bitcoin revenues. Uh, Facebook. The DM project, as they're calling it now, is partnering with Silvergate. They're looking to issue another US dollar stablecoin. So this space is absolutely all the rage and continues to continues to be so as central banks drag their heels. So um, you just look at this and laugh. You know, UK will likely need to issue a digital currency. Really? Like, surprise, surprise. We haven't been talking about this for two or three years now. Anyway. Uh, some more bad news. So it seemed like we got all the bad news at once this week. Uh, the Department of Justice investigating uh, Binance. But once again, if you look beneath the surface, Binance were actually cooperating with the DOJ and the IRS over some record keeping or whatnot. So it feels like the media is trying to beat crypto wallets down at the moment. Um, but there is some good news amongst all this chaos this week. 
Um, we did see Polygon active users grow by 75,000. So the DeFi boom continues, but Polygon has really been that leader. So they've stamped their authority on the scaling space. They've helped Ethereum scale. Some projects have already moved there. Um, and that's why it's been one of the strongest performers. DeFi, this is a good tweet from Larry Cermak here. So it, it kind of falls in line with everything we've been saying of late. But DeFi protocols that are already building products to take advantage of optimistic roll up So this is the thing that I've been focused on and telling you that in the coming weeks, it's not months or years away. In the coming weeks, we are going to see a lot of these projects come out with these upgrades and, and really surprise people. And I think that's exactly what Polygon has done. Um, Umbrella Network has migrated over to uh, Binance Chain. So yes, I know some projects are going to do that. They're going to make the switch to Binance Chain if they can't be bothered waiting for Ethereum to scale. But I think a lot um, are going to take that other route and look to incorporate with Polygon or the suite of the optimistic roll-up um, products. Uh, Quedro raising $11 million to decentralize crypto custody. So I love how DAOs is really starting to get a bit of momentum. And one of the things that we said was going to be a mainstream narrative and an area that you want to have exposure to in your portfolio this year, um, DAOs and the importance of decentralized autonomous organizations is becoming clear. Uh, Australian Bitcoin miner Iris is the latest to weigh in on a SPAC deal. So this is combining just about all the hype terms of 2021. You know, SPACs, Bitcoin, mining, um, and in Australia of all places. I, I don't know if this will get the uh, tick of approval, but I do know that we've got those ETFs very, very close in Australia in the coming weeks. Uh, Iran Central Bank is banning trading of foreign mined Bitcoin. So remember, they're looking to take hold or custody of all the Bitcoins that they're getting through their mining operations locally. But this is the new China bans Bitcoin. And literally this week, we also had Hong Kong regulators said to ban retail trading of Bitcoin. <sighs> this is an absolute, you know, if I had a, one of the predictions that I literally made last year and even the year before that, I think, and maybe before that, that this was the next attack vector of Bitcoin, you know, the energy usage. And you can't make this up. Here's why Bitcoin is a danger to the environment. You know, this is absolute bull crap. I've spoken so many times about how Bitcoin is highly renewable. It's it's driving the wave. It's it's leading the charge. Some countries and politicians should take a leaf out of Bitcoin's book in terms of how quickly it's going renewable. But anyway, it's the mainstream media uh, publications that are going to keep picking on Bitcoin for the time being. You know, Greenpeace has stopped accepting Bitcoin donations citing high energy usage. So this is the stuff that's the second order effects that the mainstream media cause. And it's all just education, guys. So this is why our focus is education. Hopefully, you can tell your friends if they bring up something like this. You know, well, Greenpeace is wrong because you know X, Y, Z. Bitcoin gets its energy from mainly renewable sources. Uh, Elon Musk clarifies that Tesla hasn't sold any of their Bitcoins. So there's a lot of fear after his tweet storm about all that energy usage stuff. Um, but I don't know if he has either. I really do think that he's a long-term hodler. It feels like someone's almost put a gun to his head and told him to go out and say that. And he doesn't want to upset the crypto community on one hand, but he doesn't want to upset the powers that be. So it's no surprise that these follow-up tweets we saw were things like, you know, Tesla has diamond hands to try and get back on side. Uh, and sure enough, Peter Schiff's out there giving him a bit of grief as well. Um, Kathy Wood, ARK Invest, there's plenty of others that have come out and sort of said, look, we stand by Elon's tweets. This is what he meant. Yes, we want to help drive the renewable adoption um, and growth uh, in hand in hand with Bitcoin. But that has, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, macro sector of the video, it has meant that we have seen some redemption and some profit taking. Um, maybe it is just healthy and rebalancing, which we have to expect from some of these big crypto funds and investment funds. But it's nothing to really worry about at this stage. Uh, US Treasury, another, I guess, kicking of Bitcoin while it was down this week. 
these rumors that they're going to have to strengthen the um, tax compliance and the IRS is looking to monitor all these transactions over ten thousand dollars. I'd be thinking that that already happens in most countries, just like it does in Australia. Um, no surprise. I really don't think there's been anything new here to scare the market as prices have continued to tumble. Um, but tumble they did, and we saw Bitcoin down now 50% from its high over 30 days, but Ethereum down 50% in just eight days. So um, make no mistake, if we have a look at the daily chart here, it's been a pretty wild ride with Bitcoin bottoming out at around a tick under 30,000 on some exchanges, uh, Ethereum being clobbered as well, reaching a low of uh, 1,800 on some exchanges. So guys, I do tend to think that this is a, a washout of the leverage, a shakeout of the new players that came in early. This is why I was so cautious and constantly saying to take profits on the way up. I, I do think we're sort of overvalued and we're probably due for some sort of big correction. Um, and, and now we've had that. Look, technically, I thought we were set up to actually have a crack at 70,000 before all the Elon tweets. But at the same time, we knew that we just hadn't had a big, decent correction and we're just making slightly higher highs. It just didn't feel natural and there's some great videos out there about how that now this now does look like uh, the Wyckoff distribution and then sell off but even if that is the case um, these are the kind of levels that we'd expect to take off from again so unless we get continued bad news I just don't see that the top um, possibly being in for now because if you think about all the money and all the infrastructure that the Wall Street and exchanges and everyone has sort of laid out for the next wave of mainstream adoption, um, DeFi is starting to scale, all those pieces of the puzzle are falling into place. To me, it doesn't really make sense for that to have to wait another two or three years to run out an entire um, bear market before we get another positive wave of not only investment, but I guess adoption in that crypto cycle. So look, I remain pretty positive. For me, the hope is that blue chips start to move independently. Um, good projects are recognized and, and can really move um, off their own doings, off their own achievements, milestones, and not everything in, term, in terms of, oh, oh, alts are moving together. Alts are so correlated. Uh, you know, whatever Bitcoin does, alts are going to do. We want fresh money coming in. We want it directed at the good projects. And if we do all that, I think we'll be uh, very happy and healthy. So I guess, guys, just... Um, in wrapping up, again, for those that didn't listen to the start, um, for the time being, I might be making less content publicly on, on YouTube and Twitter and whatnot because I have got a few things that I'm working on, passion projects behind the scene. Uh, I do want to get, I guess, myself right, uh, physical health and that mental health heading into it, what I think is another big cycle heading forward. So look, thanks to everyone for those kind messages of support. Um, the team have got more than enough content for everyone to keep up with. I'm still reading all the posts, reading all the research. I'll always chime in and do videos when there's important things to update on. Uh, but yeah, nothing to worry about there. There's always things happening behind the scenes, even if there's not videos going out regularly. Uh, but members, hey, let's look forward to another big week ahead. I think it's a very exciting time. Uh, I don't think we're at blood in the streets um, levels yet. Some people thinking that, hey, this is pretty bad. But for those of you that have been through a big cycle, uh, trust me, it can get a lot worse, particularly for the bad altcoins that were massively overvalued. Things can get a lot worse for them as well before they get better. So that's it for me this week, guys. I hope you've all been well. Um, smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, share these videos around, and I'll talk to you again soon. Cheers.